Lord, we thank you for everything you have done for us. Have you taken us from when we were very first born to where we are at in our lives? The different things you have taught us and how you guided us to this place. Lord, we pray for the day, pray for my message, that it's a pleasing offering to you, and that it's guidance for other people. Please help me today. Just I pray. Amen. So it's Father's Day today. And like Liz said, some of us have had really good fathers. Some of us don't have that great experience. And I'm kind of stuck in the middle. I've had a dad that's involved in my entire life. My mom and dad were married um, for 33 years now, at least. So he's been involved with my my life, my brothers and sisters' life, uh, there we have seven, seven siblings. So if you can imagine the type of house I grew up in. I have a sister who has Down syndrome, and I have two siblings who have ADHD. So you throw those three things into the mix, too, on top of being a dad of seven, and then you have a dad who has bipolar. And I'm not saying that as a negative way today. I want to honor him today because he has done a good job with what he had. And he is following Christ. See, men and fathers, we're overworked. We're isolated. We can become isolated. We're never enough. Never enough for our wife, our kids, church. We always are getting pulled in all these different ways. And in getting pulled in all these different ways, we start getting burned out. So then we start getting grumpy, and we start getting short-fused. And I, I'm a dad, and I know that I'm not perfect. So I know that my dad, he's a dad, and he's not perfect either. We never have time just to sit down ourselves and recover and rejuvenate because we're always getting pulled in these different ways. And then we have kids, and those kids then become overworked, isolated, never enough for their family, never enough for their church, never enough for their work. And the cycle keeps keep going on and on and on. See, I can go back to my great-grandpa. My great-grandpa, his, his wife that he had two kids with, my, gra my dad and his, um, his sister, both of them, she walked out on him. On Christmas Eve, she left and decided that she didn't want to do it anymore. And so he was stuck with raising two kids, being a teacher, which teachers get laid off in the summertime. And then in the culture that they were, in the time frame that they were during, that was kind of looked upon, down upon. So he was left to raise two kids by himself the best that he could. Now, up until within the last year, I didn't realize that I had anger against my dad because I thought that my, some of the things that my dad had done, I didn't understand it. And there was a, a big disconnect between him and me because I didn't understand that. I didn't realize I had that anger. And anger is kind of like, I call it a Chinese growing vine. You can have a vine that right over here comes up and if you don't like it, it crawl, crawls across your house has all these nice flowers, but it starts going and breaking down your foundation. And if you cut it off there, the root system is so strong that it'll come up on the other side of the driveway. And it'll come up and you clip it off there and it's still, not, it's still not dead, it comes up on the other side. So you clip it off, you keep clipping off, you keep chasing around. Anger is the same way. Anger shows up in your work and you're like, well, I'm, I'm done with that. And you move on to over here, and then anger shows up in your family. And so I'm saying this because today is Father's Day. And we need to have grace for our fathers. We need to have grace for our fathers and grace for our grandfathers. And kids, we need to have grace for you. So today I want to honor my dad because he did a great job with what he had. And he said, like Jim said last week, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
And so he started serving the Lord and started going to church. Today, we're talking about fathers, but I want to focus today on communion, the body, and the Great Commission. And this is something that God has showed me, and I want to share it with you guys, because I think it's really important how all of these things tie together and how we can become a better church, a better body of believers, so that we can better and more efficiently go out and reach the people of Ottumwa and the surrounding communities. So Revelations 13, 19 says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write these. Are, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one of these. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear. So you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. See, so the first part of that talks about how these people thought they knew what they were doing. They thought that they knew how to have a relationship with God, how to have a relationship with their father. He says, but you're missing it. And so, I've got a little illustration. And this illustration is going to go through the whole sermon. So, some of it's going to be repeated because it all goes together. So this bread is dry. It's crusty. There's sometimes not a use for it. And just because it's bread and is on the table doesn't mean it's, a for, it's doing anything. So the people... The church, in the beginning, he was saying, you're here. You show up to church, and you just sit on the table. He says, I know the inside and out, and I find you find little to my liking. You're neither hot nor cold. You see, water, he's saying, you're not here or you're not here. You're not good for washing dishes, and you're not good for for drinking. You're somewhere in the middle. He's saying, you're sitting on the table. You're not participating in church. You're just sitting there. You're not outside telling people how they can get saved and have a relationship. You're not either way. You're not on either sides of the spectrum. You're just right in the middle. He goes, and you think you have it all made. You think just because you show up to church that you have, you have a relationship with me. He goes, but that's not true. He goes, I'm standing on the outside. I'm knocking on the door. And I want you to open it. And when he says, uh, come in and eat, that means that he is approving of what we're doing. So one of the, term, one of the, one of the versions says sup. And when you sup with somebody, you come in and you sit down and you have a relationship. So you have this dry bread and he's saying, I want you, because you're dry, I want you to come sup. I want you to soak in. And then the bread's wet. The bread's soft. The bread's usable again. We're out in the world 
and we get dry. And we have to constantly come back to God and say, how am I in relationship with you? How can I become better? Because the world will take and they'll get us hot and they'll dry us out. And if we don't keep coming back to God and keep having communion with him, we'll turn back into the dry, crusty bread. There's communion and community. And when you look up communion, the word for communion is koinonia. And pastor has talked about having koinonia groups. Groups where you do community together. The difference between community and communion, they're the exact same thing except communion, you're participating in a relationship, a spiritual relationship. We have a daily relationship and it refreshes us. John 13. And it, this is a, John 13 is when he's in the upper room. And he says, and these things he says, Jesus, after he said these things, Jesus became visibly upset. And then he told them why. One of you is going to betray me. Disciples looked around at each other and wondered who on earth he was talking about. And one of the disciples, the one Jesus loved dearly, was reclining against him. His head on his shoulder, Peter motioned him and he said, he asked Jesus who might be. So being the closest, he said, Master who? Jesus said, the one who I give this crust of bread after I've dipped it. Then he dipped the crust and he gave it to Judas. See, back in, that, back in the Bible times, the bread would be made daily. And, by the time, and there was no preservatives. This, is, this has preservatives in it. And so it's, it's somewhat soft still. And they would sit on the table and they would eat off of it. And by the time it got to that evening, it would be dry. And they would take... And to be able to use it again for the meal, he would, they dipped it in. And so Jesus is going, Judas, you're dry. And I want you to be filled up. I want you to become soft. And he's offering Judas that chance, that forgiveness, that love. He's offering it to him as a token. He's offering it to him to change his life. I really believe that if Jews had taken that and understood what it was, he wouldn't have done that. See, we have to have a personal relationship with Christ so that we don't become hard and dry and bitter. We have to be in constant relationship with him. And just like our fathers, we might not have a good heaven, uh, an earthly father to look after, but we have a heavenly father who's perfect, who is love, who is a comforter, who takes care of us, who is a strong tower. And like Diane shared last, a couple weeks ago, when she had her, her first baby, she realized that there was a stronger love than what she had noticed, what she had known before. I I got to see this on the opposite side. I was at a friend's uh, uh, friend of mine lost his son, and I was at the funeral, and I could I noticed how much my friend was crying and how he was mourning for his son, his son, and how hard that was on him. A, a, this man is a sinful man. Somebody who doesn't understand pure love. And he is crying for his son that's no longer there. 
And God goes, I cry for each one of us. Each one of you, he cries for even more so because he has a pure love. He wants us to partake and sup with him. He wants us to suck him in. When we become dry, he wants us to dig into him and become soft. Just like that. Because when we do that, then we become soft. And then, when we start working around other people, we're nice and wet. And then we go like that. And this bread is now a little bit soft too. Not the same soft as if it was dipped in. But the more you go like this, the drier this bread gets, the wetter this bread gets. So you keep going like that. And then you go like this. Because we're supposed to be in daily relationship with him. And the next day, we go to a coworker, And we rub off on him a little bit more. And that works, not just in our co-workers, but that works in the body. So Ephesians 4. Says, in the light of this... Hear what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out of there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to to travel. We each have, thing, we each have a mission that God has given us. He's going, I don't want you just to sit there and go, yes, that's my mission. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. He goes, get out there and chase after the mission that God has given you. Do something about it. Go out and start giving over to other people. Letting other people see that Christ's love for you, what it can do for them, and how it has changed you. And once you were dry, and now you're soft, and let that rub off on other people. So run on the road God called you to travel. I, want, I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that, grow, that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourself out for each other in acts of love. Alert at, uh, alert at noticing differences, quick at mending fences. Because he says, we're supposed to work together. We're not supposed to be all isolated on our own. We're supposed to be working together as a body. You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction. So stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one fa and, and Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think you do is permeated with oneness. But that doesn't mean... You should have to you should look all should all look and speak and act the same. Out of generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift. The text for this is he climbed the high mountain, he captured the enemy and seized the plunder. He handed it all, he handed it all out in gifts to the people. Is it not true that the one who climbed up also climbed down? down to the valley of the earth. And the one who climbed down is the one who climbed back up and up to the highest heaven. He handed out the gifts above and below, filled the heaven with his gifts, filled the earth with his, filled earth with his gifts. 
He handed out the gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work. Working within the Christ body, the church, until we are all moving rhythmically and easily with each other. So my dad, like I shared, had said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he started putting that into practice. And the churches that we were attending, he wasn't involved with. Partly because of his disability. And so we would go to a church and then we'd kind of move away. And in the process of that, I started finding other mentors. I started finding stepdads, spiritual stepdads. So I know that I, as a dad, don't do the greatest job sometimes. And like my dad did. So I need all of you guys to help with my kids, raising my kids, because we're supposed to work together as a body. A broken church is unable to efficiently grow and share Christ. If we are all out working together or working separately and not working together, we start wasting resources to do things. And so by coming together and realizing that we're a body and we're supposed to be working together, we can start doing things more efficiently. We need each other. We need community. So while I am at work and I'm dry and I'm and guys at work are starting to wear me down and I see Kevin come up with the air gas truck and drop off the air gas bottles and he knows that I come to church here and he goes, how are you doing? And I can say, I'm not doing that great. I'm a little irritated and kind of frustrated with things. And he can go, well, you just need to be patient. Can I pray for you? And so, as a body, as people who are working together and sharing community, we're able to help each other. So that I, I can get through the day and I can come back and I can sit down and I can say, I need you to help me. I need you to show me why I'm irritated and how I can do that how I can not be irritated. So we'll look at everybody look at each, somebody, not their spouse, and look at them and say, I need you. Because sometimes we know, yeah, I, I, I can say that in my heart and I can say that quietly. But we need each other as a body. Another scripture, another reference when he talks about the body, he goes, we all can't be a foot. We all are connected in church and we're all connected to each other. If the church, if the, if the foot goes, hey, lop it off, the, bo- the, the, the rest of the body isn't able to walk around very efficiently because it doesn't have one of its feet. And then likewise, that foot, it goes off by itself and tries doing its own thing, it doesn't have the blood flow that it needs to stay surviving. So we need each other, and we need to respect each other, and we need to pray for each other. We need to lift each other up. The Bible says, whatever is lovely and pure, think on these things. We need to think about those things and we need to focus on those things when we talk to other people in church too. And not just churches in in this building, but actually outside these walls. So, relief for me as a dad, I can be a fractured dad. I can be not a whole dad. I'm trying to move in that direction. Because I can have a body, I can have Jerry say, hey, you need to be a little bit softer with your kids. Because there are other people who can come alongside of me and help me 
become a better dad. And I can come along somebody else and help them be a better dad and say, hey, I've, I used to be a really, really strong uh, dad, and I used to be really strict with my kids. And I realized that, that that doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work the way it should. And I have to be gracious, and I have to be loving, and I have to be still dis- I have to disobedient or um, dis- <laughs> correct them, but I can correct them in a soft way that is more efficient, that is better for them instead of coming off really, really hard. We can all have stand-in parents in the body of Christ. There's been several that I have had And I've even had stand-in grandmothers because my grandmother wasn't involved. So the people that are in this body can help each other and we can become one so we can start moving forward. Another verse that, another story that um, came to my mind when I was talking about this was the the story of the men that took their friend who was paralyzed, who was laying on the mat, picked them up, went over to where Jesus was at. And in going to Jesus, the house was all full. And they weren't able to get in. So they went, and they went up to the roof, and they started tearing apart the ceiling tiles so that they could lower their friend down into the room where Jesus was at. You're like, how does that work with the body? We can come along somebody who is struggling and we can bring them to Jesus. We can bring them and say, we need, this is how Jesus helped me. We can do that within the church, but we also need to do that within the, within the community. So now we just went from being focused to people in this, here with this body, we focused to going out. So in Mark 16, 14, so this is after Jesus has res- been resurrected. They're up on the hill, and it says, says still, later, still later, as eleven were eating supper, he appeared to them and took them to the task, most severely for their stubborn unbelief. Refusing to believe those who had seen him raised up, then he said, Go into the world, go everywhere, and announce the message of God's good news to all people. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved, and whoever refuses to believe is damned. These are some things, some of the signs that will accompany believers. They will throw out the demons in my name, they will speak in new tongues, they will take snakes in their hands, they will drink poison and not be hurt. They'll lay hands on the sick and make them well. Then Jesus, after briefing them, was taken up to heaven, and he sat down beside God in a place of honor. See, if we don't take time and have a relationship daily with God, a dry bread to dry bread, doesn't do any good. Then when you start having a relationship with Christ and you start fellowshipping with him and having a relationship, he starts softening you up so that you can start going to other people in church and having a relationship with them. And then you have two pieces of bread who are saturated And this bread, who doesn't show up to church, who's out in the world, and you have two people who are out, who leave church, and they go, and they start soaking that bread up. And that bread then gets a little bit of what Jesus is. Now this bread isn't in relationship with Jesus. It's it's getting some of the side effects of two Christians who are in a relationship. We have to bring people to Jesus. 
We have to bring them not to church, but we have to show them how he has impacted our life. Somebody who is angry, I can now go to and say, you know, I used to be angry. I used to be angry at my dad because he didn't raise me the way I thought he was supposed to raise me. And I think that you have some anger issues, and I want to let you know that God is not an angry God. He's a loving God. And the anger that you have in your life is creating issues with your kids. And so if you work on your anger issues, it'll help you have a better relationship with him. You'll have a fuller life. So because I have worked through those anger things, and I'm still working through things with anger. I'm not saying I'm perfect. We work through things. But I can share what Jesus has done for me. I can share other places where Jesus has brought me through and how he has changed me and how I'm not the same person. I shared with Jim last week that some of you met my dad last, uh, a couple weeks when my daughter was baptized. One thing that I have never seen him do is go out of his way and shake people's hands and tell them who he was. You see, he got hooked up in a church that was focused on him, focused on having a relationship with Christ. And in finding a church that was focused on relationship with Christ, they were, over, they were able to overlook his disabilities. And then he was able to find a body of believers who could help him realize it's not all about, all about my dad. And Jim asked me, he goes, what changed? Fifteen years ago, my dad would come in, sit down, not say anything, and then when he'd leave, he would complain about how the church never said hi to him. Now, he's coming into a church he's never been into before, and shaking people's hands, saying, hi, I'm Isaac's dad. What's changed? He's in a relationship. He's a relationship in a relationship with God, and he's also in a body of believers who's having a relationship together and that, that body of believers looks different. They all primarily have disabilities. But they're all focused on having a relationship with God. Focused on how to do, better, do life better together. So God has changed my life. He has made me a more calm person more level-headed. He's made my house a house of peace. A house that has, yes, we disagree and we argue, but we don't have blow-up, all-out, drag-out, knock-out fights. That's how he's changed my life. I grew up with parents who would have knock-out, drag-out fights. And so by my dad saying, today I serve the Lord, he has been able to stop that cycle. And in all of this, you're like, how does this reflect? We have a loving father. A father who has set up a system or a way for us to know how we can be better. We don't have a father who is angry with us. We have a father who wants us to be better than what we are. Who wants us to be out of sin. He doesn't want us to be dry pieces of bread. He wants us to have life that's fuller. Life more abundantly. When we talk about life abundantly, we're not talking about all the nice, richety things. We're talking about having a life that is saturated in Him. So I want to encourage you to, one, sit down and sup with God. Sit down and let Him influence you and point out the things in your life that need to be changed. Two, bring that to church. 
Sometimes we don't like talking about how we aren't perfect people. So bring that to church and say, hey, one, can you pray with me? Can you pray with me so that I can get over this? And then when you do get over that, do like the, the four men and their, their friend did. They rejoiced. They, had, they got to share in the story that they were involved in. Let people know, I used to be an angry person, and now I'm not angry anymore because Jesus helped me get through that. And then three, share with other people outside and bring them in. See, we have to be in fellowship and a community with people. Koinonia. Having a group of people who are focused on each other and focused in a relationship with Christ. This is good, but it's hard to bring somebody who's never been to church in here because they believe that everybody in here is hypocrites. But if you're able to go to church, go to work and say, hey, you know what? This is what God, I used to be like that. And now God has changed me and I'm not like that anymore. Don't you think it'd be a little bit easier for you to then bring them to church or meet some of your other friends? that have come to the church here. So I want to challenge you on those things. Challenge somebody, or ask somebody, what are you reading in the Bible? What's God showing you? Let's move away from being on the surface to getting in deeper. What's God teaching you? What's God challenging you on? How can I pray for you? I want to close with a word of prayer. Lord, we want to be more like you. We want to be softer people. We want to be more gracious. We want to overlook people's sins and take them and pick them up and want to bring them to you so that you can change them and make them whole again, Lord. Because that's what you've done for us. Lord, please help us to go out to other people in the world and pick them up and carry them to you because you're the healer. You're the one that makes us whole again. We can't make us soft again. No matter what we do, we can only just try. Let's have a relationship with you. Lord, let's sit down and have sup with you. Please help us, Lord, to be a better church, a better group of people who are following you to bring in other people to help follow them and change their life, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done in my life and how you've changed me and how you've carried me through the different times in my life, Lord. Please help other people share their story. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.